So if last class we talked about the basic motives that explain why we help, this class will explore the specific situational factors that affect whether or not we intervene in situations where our help could be useful. So if you watched the last set of videos, you're familiar with the social responsibility norm, which states that we have an obligation to help other people, and specifically those who are highly dependent on our help. That means people who might be weaker, less capable or self-sufficient, and specifically people who don't have other sources of aid. And so carrying this out might seem pretty straightforward. This is pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory, right? This might imply that if you become aware that defenseless baby seals are being hunted in Alaska, you might advocate for policies that ban this practice. If you know that there are local children in your community who are going hungry, you might be impelled to donate to a food bank or volunteer at a soup kitchen. And if you see a young woman on the street who seems to be being followed by a kind of intimidating looking guy, you might feel like you should go up to her and ask if she wants, you know, an escort home, or at least keep an eye on her for a while to make sure that nothing bad happens. So carrying this out might seem pretty straightforward. This is a very self-explanatory rule, after all. But it turns out that this can be a lot harder in practice, in messy, real-world situations. And one of the reasons why is something that we call the bystander effect. And this is a concept and a term that was coined in response to the Kitty Genovese story. So this is a really tragic incident where a young woman was brutally murdered immediately outside of her apartment building in Kew Gardens, Queens. And supposedly, so the story goes, there were a number of people, perhaps dozens, who overheard, saw what was happening, and could have intervened if they wanted to, but instead chose to stay out of it. So let's take a look. In 1964, 38 New Yorkers watched through their windows as one of their neighbors was brutally murdered. Her name was Kitty Genovese, a 28-year-old woman. The Genovese incident where a young woman coming home late at night from her work was assaulted by somebody who was one of those random, crazy people. Kitty was running up the block, and Winston Mosley ran after her until she reached the midpoint of the block was directly under this streetlight. Mosley caught up with her and stabbed her four times in the back. Her screams were loud, unmistakable, and reverberated throughout the entire area. Lights went on in, in the windows around the courtyard, so we know that people were seeing this. Nobody called the police. Somebody who lived on the seventh floor opened his window and yelled out, what's going on down there? When Mosley heard somebody yelling out, he ran back to his car. Kitty was still alive. She managed to get up. She staggers around the corner here, still screaming. People in that building heard her as well. And she collapses inside this hallway. There's one apartment above there. It was occupied by Carl Ross. Carl opened his door at the time that Mosley returns and he saw the second attack taking place. And he did nothing. After stabbing Kitty another eight times in this very hallway, the killer ran away, leaving Kitty to bleed to death. Eventually, a neighbor called the police, but it was too late. Kitty died before the ambulance could get her to the hospital. That shocked the city. Now, it's not that a person got murdered that shocked the city. That happens, sadly. It's that a person got murdered and her neighbors watched and nobody did anything. So that's the classic story. And that's the story about Kitty Genovese that you may have encountered if you've taken, for instance, a psych class in high school. It turns out the real story might be a lot more complicated, 
there's been subsequently a lot of question about exactly how many people really could have witnessed this event, whether or not it's really true that nobody tried to do anything, and why exactly people stayed silent and stayed out of the situation. And to dig into this, I'm going to ask you to go and take a look at this massively interesting New Yorker article. Details why these events were originally interpreted in this very black and white way, and the details of how we're coming to a more complex understanding of this story. So despite the fact that this story might have been a little bit oversimplified, despite the fact that the Kitty Genevieve story actually may not be the best example of the bystander effect, it nevertheless sparked an incredibly useful and important line of research. And this was really driven by two psychologists, John Darley and Bib Latine, who learned about the Genovese story and just had this burning desire to understand how it's possible that this could have happened. And one insight that they had is that this may not have been about the evil or the deep apathy of Kitty Genovese's neighbors. But instead, the fact that there were so many of them, that she was living in a dense urban environment. And so any single resident of this building might have had a strong sense of conviction that somebody else living there probably already would have done something. Surely, out of all the people living in this building, somebody has already called the cops, alerted someone, or tried to do something about it. And so we're going to see John Darley talking a little bit about the origins of this line of research. Bib Latine and I, we read about the murder, as did everybody else. Here we were two young social psychologists starting our research careers. We knew about Stanley Milgram's set of experiments on obedience to authority. And we started to think about, in an offhand way, what could have produced the Genovese effect. Perhaps. Kitty Genovese might have been alive today if fewer people had seen her. There were perhaps 38 people who could have responded, but each were looking to see what these other people were doing. Uh, we decided to try to create a relatively ambiguous situation in which we could see how people responded. We thought that one kind of thing that comes up that's often hard to tell whether it's a real emergency or not uh, has to do with fire. You see smoke coming through the vent, and it is ambiguous. What do you do? There's, there's smoke coming out from under the door in that room where I was filling out the questionnaire. Almost everybody does that if they face the smoke alone. Now let's have you face the smoke with two strangers. One person can be seen glancing at the other. The other is continuing to fill out the questionnaire. It's getting a little more smoky in the room, but nonetheless, you stay in the room. By and large, people surrounded by people who react as if there's nothing wrong don't respond. Everybody sees the other people not reacting, so they create a definition of the situation. No emergency. So the study that John Darley just described provides some really intriguing evidence that adding more people to a situation can make help less likely. And in this case, it really seems like having more people around can create a circumstance where you feel pretty confused about whether or not an emergency is even happening. But think about the differences between this and the Genovese case. If you see somebody who looks like they're being violently attacked, you're probably pretty certain that an emergency is happening. And so how can you explain here how adding more people would make you less likely to help? Well, John Darley is about to tell us about a second set of studies they conducted designed to test this exact question. What happens when you make it pretty unambiguous that something bad is happening, but you still have a crowd of people around who don't really seem to be doing anything? 
And this is how they set it up. So they brought a bunch of people into their lab and they put them in little sort of cubicles or phone booths. So they were having a conversation, but they were having it entirely over an intercom. And the central manipulation of this study is whether or not the person was only talking one-on-one -on -one with another participant, whether they were linked up with two other people, or whether they were connected by intercom to several other people. So this is then the critical event that happens in the study. One of these fellow participants, if it's the one-on-one -on -one situation, it's the single other person you're talking to, um, or just one of the other participants, starts to have a seizure. And the way that they set this up is that the person has explained that they're prone to epilepsy. And then in the middle of the conversation, you start to hear them stuttering. You know, they say that something strange is going on, that they don't feel right. And then you hear a chair crash. So what do you do? And I'll let John Darley again explain the results of this study. To test their theories about how groups and individuals respond differently to a crisis, Darley and Latine conducted a second experiment. This time, the emergency was clearly defined. First of all, I would like to thank the two of you for being here today to help out in this study. In this experiment, one student was asked to communicate via intercom with another student down the hall. If somebody give me a little help here, because I, I'm having a problem, I've got one, one of these, these things coming on. What sounded like a real seizure in the subject's headphones was just a tape recording of an actor playing a role for the experiment. If somebody would, would give me a, a little, little help, or, or, Hello? Could somebody or, help? Or, if you knew there was nobody else but you to help, you got up, you opened the door of your room, and you headed off to find the person. On the other hand, if there were three or four other people present who you heard... I would like to thank the three of you for being here today to help us with the study. We are interested in... Learning. You are much less likely to respond yourself. Somebody, give, give me a little, a little help here. The responsibility any individual feels for helping is diffused when there are other people who could also help. The specific pattern of results that Darley and Latine observed. So they were always looking at the number of people who did something to seek help, got up, left the cubicle, went and contacted the experimenter within a predefined interval of time, within a couple minutes of this person seeming to have the seizure. And so if you are talking one-on-one -on -one with this person who's in distress, you are very likely to seek help. A full 85% of those participants would quickly get up and seek out the experimenter. If there was one other bystander, one other person who was witnessing this seizure, you're still relatively likely to help. It's over half of people, so 62%, who quickly sought some kind of aid. But once there is a larger group, let's say four people, you're actually very unlikely to quickly act and seek out some kind of aid. And John Darley chalks this up to something that he calls diffusion of responsibility. So as the bystander effect has been studied in greater detail, there's actually now a broad range of reasons people have identified that having a lot of other folks around can make it difficult to help. And so really it has to do with this step-by-step -step process where when there's an emergency occurring, a lot of things need to go right before you're likely to successfully help. And the first thing that needs to go right is you need to actually notice that an emergency is taking place. So let's say you are walking down a busy street in New York City and there's somebody who suddenly falls down right smack dab in the middle of the sidewalk. Now, Again, if there's a ton of people around, it's a noisy street, maybe you have your headphones in or you're looking at your phone, you might not even notice this person stumbling and falling. And if you don't notice that there's an emergency, there's no way that you can help. But let's say that you do notice this person fall down. 
You have to then interpret the event as an emergency that could benefit from your help. So maybe this person has just taken a quick stumble, maybe they got some dirt on the knee of their pants, but they're totally fine and there's no reason for you to go ask them if they're okay, see what's going on. And having more people around can not only make a situation busy or hectic or draw your attention away from an event, preventing you from noticing it, it can also make you less likely to interpret the event as an emergency. Why is that? Well, if you see a bunch of other people around and they also don't seem to be paying this event any mind, again, you're on a busy New York City street, um, you see someone take a fall, you look around to see how other people are reacting, and everyone else seems mm, unbothered. You might think, well, if they don't think there's an emergency, there probably isn't. It's sort of like that informational influence that we talked about with the ASH study. And so the more people who are around, all of them can be looking to each other to kind of try to get an index of whether or not the event is an emergency. And all of them might get the information that everybody else in the situation looks unbothered. And so you might fail to provide help. Then, even if you concretely um, interpret the situation as a potential emergency, you have to assume that it is your particular responsibility to intervene. And it's pretty obvious how having a lot of bystanders around could influence this. You're on that busy New York City street with maybe 50 other people. You have somewhere you need to be. You don't want to get sidetracked. And so you think, surely somebody else will stop and help this person. I don't need to. So you might fail to help. Finally, let's say you feel a burden of responsibility on your shoulders. And so you really do think that you should assist if you can. You might not necessarily feel like you know how. And how could that be influenced by the presence of bystanders? Well, in two different ways. One of them is that you might think, surely there is somebody else in this crowd of people who knows, let's say, how to do CPR better than I do. Maybe there's a doctor. Maybe there's somebody who's qualified to diagnose this person and see whether or not they have a problem. A second category of reason is when there's a lot of people around, we can get really nervous about our performance. We can get really nervous about being judged by others. And if you try to intervene and you don't do a good job of it, you might feel this anxiety about what other people would think of you. If there's nobody around, there's no audience, there's no one to watch, and so you don't feel that same anxiety. And you really have to get through all of these stages. You have to jump over all of these hurdles in order to successfully provide help. You have to notice the event. You have to decide it really is an emergency. You have to think that you're the person who should help. And you have to feel capable of knowing how. And having a lot of people around can interfere with each of these steps. So let's put some labels to these different steps in the process. The fact of bystanders making it more likely that you would fail to notice an event is just called distraction. The way that bystanders can look to each other to try to see whether or not they should be interpreting an event as dangerous or an emergency is called pluralistic ignorance. This is that process of looking around to the crowd of people around you, seeing that they have a blank face, but they're also looking at you and seeing that you have a blank face and everybody else is using everyone else's inaction as a signal that they should ignore what's happening. The process of failing to as assume responsibility because there's lots of people around is called diffusion of responsibility. And this is one of the things that um, John Darley and Bib Latine really pointed to in trying to explain the results of their experiments. And finally, this anxiety that we can feel about whether or not an audience of people, a crowd of people, will judge us for being less competent, that's called audience inhibition. So, lest you think, okay, well you're telling me that the Kitty Genovese case may not actually have been a case of bystander inhibition or the bystander effect. There have been more recent incidents that actually show this phenomenon to an even greater degree. A really particularly tragic case happened even just this last September, a young man named Cassine Morris. 
And you may have heard about this, but he was a 16-year-old living in Long Island. He got into a dispute with a group of other guys. There was some competition over um, a young woman that one of them was dating. And he was brutally attacked and stabbed by these seven other people. And not only is this tragic, but there were, it's estimated between 50 and 70 other teenagers who watched this all happen. They were in a strip mall in a public space. And not only did no one intervene physically or call the police, but in fact, some people filmed it for social media. So this is something that I would definitely chalk up um, in numerous ways to a case of the bystander effect. So given that the bystander effect can have sometimes horrific consequences, um, sometimes just mildly unfortunate consequences, how can we make it more likely? Um, I'm not going to ask you to do this as a formal reflection, but I'd actually just like you to take some time yourself to really go through each step in this process and maybe kind of think about how you might try to personally overcome each of these different inhibiting factors. <laughs> 